Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, this is Dr. Eswar. Um, we're here for the Chronic Public Pain and Endometriosis webinar. Um, I have three panels with me, um, and everyone's going to introduce themselves. Just introductions for myself. I'm, I'm Dr. Eswar, one of the minimum invasive gynecologic surgeons here at NYU, and I'm also one of the chronic pelvic pain specialists here at NYU. Um, and so the next person to introduce themselves is Dr. Kelsey Kossel. Go ahead, Kelsey. Hi, good evening. My name is Dr. Kelsey Kossel. Um, I'm one of the minimally invasive gynecologic surgeons here at NYU also, and one of the members of the Endometriosis Center. And next up is Dr. Hibner. Um, go ahead, Dr. Hibner. Hey, so I, I'm Michael Hibner. I am... Um... I guess I'm a minimally, since everybody's saying that I'm minimally invasive uh, surgeon, but I, I really think my, of myself more as a pelvic pain doctor because truly um, I would say most of my cases have to do with pelvic nerves and muscles and, and, uh, and, and those things. I, I practice in for, for many years. So um, I, I had a fellowship, AGL fellowship in minimally invasive surgery and, and uh, pelvic pain and actually Dr. Ishwar Chris was my, one of my best fellows ever. Uh, and uh, I left my academic job uh, two years ago and I started my own uh, private practice that's dedicated 100% to pelvic pain for both men and women. Okay. Next up is Dr. Um, Kier Pecker. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Mira Kier Pecker. I'm also at NYU. I'm one of the anesthesiologists, interventional pain specialists with a focus more on pelvic pain and also boarded in lifestyle medicine. So kind of all three. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to give you some, some background, chronic pelvic pain is a condition there. You have pain located in the pelvis that's there for greater than six months. Um, some stats about chronic pelvic pain is that it accounts, it's seen in up to 20 to, uh, percent of women. Um, it can disrupt their life, their work. Um, sexual activity, um, sleep, and family life. So it's a really debilitating disease, um, and it's really prevalent. You know, you see women walking every day around the streets of Manhattan or anywhere in your cities that are walking around with this pain, um, and they're continuing to go on with their daily lives, but it can be really disruptive. Um, it accounts for up to 10% of all gynecologic visits, and it also accounts for about 40% of all gynecologic laparoscopy. So we see this very, very often in our practices, and unfortunately, many OBGYNs aren't well-versed in treatment of chronic pelvic pain. So having a team like we have here at NYU and, and people like Dr. Hibner that are out um, practicing makes it really, really a good place to start if you're trying to get treatment for chronic pelvic pain. Um, we know that patients with endometriosis, that counts for about one in 10 women um, in the United States. So it's very, very prevalent. And patients with endometriosis will have some other condition associated with chronic pelvic pain. Um, so Kelsey, um, can you just give us a little overview about diagnosis and treatment of endometriosis, since this is the endometriosis webinar? Sure, thank you. Um, so in our practice, when we see patients for evaluation of pelvic pain and possible endometriosis, obviously just in, in terms of diagnosis, an important first step is just a really comprehensive history. Um, and I think it's important for patients to understand that that is a big part of the diagnosis. We want to hear from you um, and we want to know about your symptoms because endometriosis doesn't affect everybody the same. And especially when we're getting into a lot of our therapies that we're considering, we're going to consider different therapies depending on exactly how endometriosis is affecting you and what symptoms it's causing. Um, so we definitely take a comprehensive history from you. Um, we want to know about anything that you've tried in the past and whether it's worked or not. So those are things to kind of mentally prepare um, that will, you know, um, that we want information we want to hear about from you. Um, and then um, I usually talk to patients, you know, a lot about, we can get a good idea if we have a sense of if someone has endometriosis from history and then moving on to more concrete um, tests. I always say to patients, really, we still consider the gold standard of diagnosis to be surgical, actually going in surgically, um, taking a biopsy of areas that look like endometriosis lesions and sending them off to the lab for testing. That being said, we obviously don't absolutely need to operate on everybody to diagnose them. Um, we can get a sense from your history. And then here, especially at N NYU, we're really big fans of ordering MRIs. Um, MRI has been 
become extremely helpful in recent years in terms of um, the evaluation of endometriosis, especially um, at a center that has an endometriosis center. We work closely with our radiologists so that they can actually really look at the images with a fine tooth comb, not only identify big endometrioma lesions like cysts of the ovaries, um, and other kind of measurable lesions, but smaller ones as well, and give us an idea of exactly where in the pelvis the endometriosis may be, um, may be affecting you. Um, so that's kind of the diagnosis of endometriosis. Um, and then did you ask about management as well? Yeah, I mean, just basic, I mean, yes, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and then, you know, I got to it a little bit, but you know that the, end, the endometriosis can be really complex to manage. Um, I always like to tell patients we have lots of tools in the toolbox, and it really just depends again on what symptoms you're having and definitely what your goals are, um, what you've tried in the past in terms of how we're going to move forward. Um, kind of broad categories, I would say we have medications, we have surgical excision. Um, and then we have a lot of complementary medicine that can be helpful as well, such as pelvic floor physical therapy and acupuncture, mindfulness, um, and other therapy options. Um, you know, a lot of our medication management is based off of the hormonal kind of action of endometriosis and quieting that process down. So there's lots of different options there. They're not all right for the right person. I feel like a lot of times patients come to me feeling maybe disregarded by prior providers who have just kind of slapped an OC, a birth control pill on them and said that should make it better. And if it doesn't, you know, I don't know why. And um, while a birth control pill can be a really great treatment for endometriosis, I oftentimes tell patients it might not just be one thing. We might need to do a birth control pill after surgical excision or with pelvic floor therapy. Um, so a lot of it is kind of layering those different options. And then obviously pulling in specialists um, that we have in terms of pain specialist as well for more interventional treatments too. Sure. Um, so Dr. Hibner, can you tell us, you know, when patients undergo surgery, there are a lot of times when patients don't have improvement after surgery. Can you give us some explanation of why that may happen? Well, you know, I, uh, there's a term that was uh, uh, coined by Maurice, uh, Maurice Chung that, uh, you may know him. He he was a pelvic pain doctor uh, in Ohio, and I think he moved now. But 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 he always talked about the evil triplets. You know, I I actually made it into evil quadruplets. Um, I think for the longest time we, as a medical society, did not have this understanding that patients with endometriosis often have other sources of pain. And. Uh, um, I actually have this slide that I uh, have showed at, at many, many conferences where there's like three or four circles that overlap each other. And, and it shows the percentages of, of, of women with you know, endometriosis that have interstitial cystitis, that have pelvic floor muscle spasm, that have irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and, and those are, uh, and this is true, probably one of my most favorite topics in endometriosis itself, because we're often missing that part of, of pelvic pain. And we get so uh, um, concentrating, we're concentrating so much on treating endometriosis and not treating pelvic pain. And um, I believe that majority of women where, um, uh, who still have pain after surgery for endometriosis just have another reason for pain. And they've always had that reason for pain. And, and this is in no way I'm saying not to treat endometriosis or not to operate on endometriosis, but those other reasons for, for pelvic pain have to be addressed. Uh, by far the most common is pelvic floor muscle spasm. So um, a lot of patients with uh, pelvic, uh, with endometriosis through this mechanism of viscerosomatic convergence and visceral visceral convergence uh, develop uh, spasm of the pelvic floor muscles. And, and that of course should be diagnosed prior to any surgical intervention. And, and that needs to be treated either together with treatment of endometriosis, or maybe in some cases, if you don't think that endometriosis is that severe, you could treat the pelvic floor muscle spasm and see if that may be enough. Um, and you can actually, from the symptoms actually really get the sense whether patient's symptoms are more related to 
endometriosis, which is more of a cyclical pain, or are the symptoms more related to uh, pelvic floor muscle spasm, which is pain with and after intercourse, etc. Uh, similar, similar comment about uh, the bladder pain. Uh, again, a lot of those patients have uh, uh, painful bladder syndrome, something we used to call interstitial cystitis. That, of course, should also be diagnosed uh, prior to, to treatment and, and addressed whether separately or during treatment of endometriosis. Um, out of those four, I mean, the third condition would be uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So that's the one I personally do not treat. Uh, that's probably the only condition I refer patients out to the GI provider. However, you know, I also have, uh, and, and a lot of physicians may disagree with me, but some agree with me. I, I have a um, strong conviction that patients develop symptoms of, uh, of irritable bowel syndrome or interstitial cystitis because of the pelvic floor muscle spasming and difficulty with voiding. Um, and, and often when you actually treat pelvic floor, um, those other symptoms usually get better. Thanks, Dr. Hibbert. <clears throat> so we're very lucky you also have Dr. Hibbert here, here at NYU for other um, pain treatments. And so Mira, what um, interventions do you have uh, available for patients with chronic pelvic pain? So I'll start with like how I would approach it in the first place. So as a pain physician, I kind of break it down into primarily symptoms. So like what's going on or how much is contributing from the pelvis, how much is contributing from the brain, and then how much is also contributing based on your lifestyle. So in terms of the pelvis, really base it more on symptoms than anything else, because as oftentimes, you know, an MRI may not show anything, but you know, it may not show any muscle spasms, for example, it's not going to show anything specific, but they still have pain. So I'm going to base it on what those characteristics of the pain is. And I kind of explain it to patients as muscles, bones, and nerves. So they're all in interplay here. And we have to kind of, kind of separate and put them together to treat each component. So if there is like a nerve kind of component, usually they kind of describe it as burning, like a burning sensation in terms of pain, um, might go different places, might be in different distributions in the pelvis, might recruit the bladder, might be the GI tract, those might be, all be a part of it. And so if there's kind of a nerve component, I can treat that with different types of nerve blocks, um, even things like radiofrequency ablation, which is basically using heat to kind of semi-permanently deaden the nerve so that it, the pain relief lasts longer. And then if there's like a muscle component, they could have injections for that. They can also have, um, or should have pelvic floor physical therapy as well. Um, and then the bones. So if there's any kind of bone related pain, aching, kind of like an aching pain, any bursa related pain, which is basically like a sack that covers the bones. If that's involved, then you can also block that and work on that through physical therapy. And so I kind of look at it in that sense in terms of the pelvis. So there are interventions that I do for that like the ones I mentioned, um, they can also do pelvic floor physical therapy. And then a brain is a big part of it because the longer that you have pain, the more sensitized your brain becomes, like the more sensitized the receptors in your brain become. And so it's sort of like the example that I use is kind of like if you bang your knee. So if you bang your knee once, it hurts. Bang it again, it hurts. But now if you keep doing that over and over again, even just simply touching it is going to be excruciating. So that's what happens in the pelvis too, or anywhere, anywhere in the body, we have pain. And so if that's a component of it. You also have to kind of treat the receptors in the brain, whether that may be through medicine or that might be through something like cognitive behavioral therapy, where you kind of work on coping mechanisms and kind of work on making um, the pain background, like background noise, rather than what you think about all the time. And so that's the second component. And then the third component is lifestyle. So what you are doing that might be worsening your pain. And there are various factors in that, but, and patients often know what triggers their pain. And if you really push, they can kind of pinpoint certain times, so especially with endometriosis, like certain things that they might be doing that worsen the pain. So your diet, so kind of focusing more on an anti-inflammatory type of diet, um, focusing on sleep, making sure that you're having healthy sleep cycles, um, stress, uh, any kind of, you know, whether you smoke, drink, any particular medications you might be taking. So there are various lifestyle factors that can also play a role in how you perceive pain. 
And so kind of when you break it down to those three things, I think that's my approach to it and the way you can kind of maximize how you treat it because there's never, especially endometriosis, it's a kind of a lifelong condition that you're managing. And so it's very difficult. There's no one solution. There's not like only surgery or only physical therapy or any one thing that's going to help. You need a whole combination of them, which is why we're here we have a team that helps with this. Definitely. Um, so what are some of the um, non-hormonal uh, medications that you use uh, in treatment for your chronic pain patients? So it really depends on what their pain feels like. So um, if it kind of feels more like a nerve, like nerve related kind of pain, then there are nerve medications that one can try. Um, things like gabapentin, Lyrica, Topamax, these are just naming a few uh, of the different nerve medications. Um, if I also think that there might be a brain component um, in terms of what I mentioned with central sensitization, where it kind of recruits those receptors in your brain, but then also things like anxiety, depression also play a part in worsening chronic pain. And so in that case, um, antidepressants can be really helpful. Antidepressants that are focused more on pain. Um, so not your standard dosing that you would for depression and not necessarily the same ones that you would go first two for depression. So there are specific ones that are a little more targeted for pain and at lower doses. So that's another type of medication. Um, and then muscle relaxants. So if the, especially if a big component of that is pelvic floor muscle spasms, things like suppositories can be helpful, like Valium or Baclofen suppositories. Um, and then also just oral muscle relaxants also just to kind of help relax the pelvic floor. So those would be the kind of the three. And then anti-inflammatories like fancy versions of ibuprofen, if you want to call it that, uh, fancy prescription strength kind of uh, versions of ibuprofen, that can also be helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Hibner, do you have any other treatments that you have available for your chronic pain patients that are kind of newer that's, that's out there? And in newer treatments? <laughs> uh, well, um, I'll tell you, uh, well, one of the most common procedures that I do as far as the procedure is, of course, injecting Botox in the pelvic floor. And, and I, I don't think I ever do endometriosis surgery without injecting Botox into the pelvic floor. But, you know, maybe I just don't really see patients with endometriosis that don't have pelvic muscle spasm. Sure. And I uh, pretty much always do that at the time of the initial endometriosis surgery. Um, and then uh, often, of course, those patients go to pelvic physical therapy, they get their uh, vaginal suppositories. I, um, I add ketamine to, I mean, to the, to, to the combination that we, that we mentioned. So it's, I use Valium Baclofen and ketamine to, to block the NMDA receptor. Uh, but despite that, those patients often need repeated Botox. So Again, I, I do the initial surgery for endometriosis together, and that's actually what I just did. I'm still wearing scrubs from that. Uh, removed a very significant endometriosis, injected Botox. Um, that patient is uh, probably going to be back in three months for another Botox. It's usually not forever, but but they usually need more than one Botox. So, so that's probably um, you know one of the most common treatments that I do. And, and then depending on, you know, what else is going on uh, with the nerves, you know, of course, the different nerve blocks and, and things like that. But, but specifically for endometriosis, that would be the, the, the Botox injection. I, uh, for some reason, um, and I don't really have a good explanation for that. I, I don't think that oral muscle relaxants work as well um, as the, the vaginal uh, Valium Baclofen ketamine. Um, and patients sometimes ask me, why, why is that? And I, I just simply really don't know. So I do not use oral muscle relaxants. As far as the other medications that we've talked about, gabapentin, etc., um, I very much believe in them. I, I, I personally don't write for them. I have other people that, that, that manage that part for me. Um, so as far as writing medications, I do Valium Baclofen, Ketamine, and, and Botox injections. Great. Um, does any of the um, attendees have any questions for our panelists or myself? Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. So, um, I was reading something about there's some new, um, like a either a laser that that people are using for or um, something placed vaginally for pelvic floor muscles. Doctor Hammer, you've heard of it? 
So I use it quite a lot. It's called solar therapy, mm -hmm. uh, S-O-L-A. Um, it is a near infrared laser light uh, that was um, basically the premise of it is, um, this is basically what I tell patients what I'm going to tell you. Sure. Um, so years ago, uh, an athletic baseball pitchers would ice their shoulders because of the of the muscle pain in between the innings to, to be able to pitch another inning. Uh, they don't do that anymore because someone came up with an idea that if you if you shine a, a powerful infrared light, a near infrared light, on the muscle, the, the, that's the light that actually penetrates deeper into the muscles. It's not the you know it doesn't stay just on the surface. It penetrates deeper into the muscles, and the muscles will absorb that light and it helps recover from, from pain and spasm. Um, so there is a, um, so that's what the athletes do these days. The baseball pitchers don't use ice anymore. They basically go to a dugout or, or locker room and, and they do that. And so do the athletes in other sports. They use it quite a lot in veterinary medicine and, and rehab, et cetera. Um, there is a urologist in Florida, Dr. Ralph Zipper. He's actually a urogynecologist that he actually knew about this and he had an idea to make that into the, into the intravaginal bond. So uh, there is a device called SOLA. It's the same laser frequency. It's a one that's um, uh, placed vaginally for three minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually need uh, nine treatments uh, on average. So you come to the office, you get it. You have to do it in the office because it's not, not anything you take home. Mm -hmm. You get a three minute treatment. Then you come back a few days later, you get a three minute treatment. Usually after four treatment, you start feeling the, feeling the improvement. Wow. The company, the, so that's purely for pelvic floor muscle spasm. Mm -hmm. uh, the company claims, um, and actually the nice thing about the, the laser is uh, that, that the actual machine is connected to the internet. So every time the patient returns, uh, you ask her or him, because we do it for male patients um, also, of course, not for endometriosis, but for other conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you ask the patient, you know, what are their pain levels? And, uh, and that's, you have to punch it in um, into, the, into the actual laser machine, the, the monitor. Mm -hmm. And that is being transmitted to Florida. Dr. Georgina Lambu, who is, um, she's a chief medical officer for that company. She basically compiles the data. And uh, so the numbers, the outcomes really come from that data that is being sent every day from every single device around the country. Um, the company claims that 70% of patients get better um, after using the solar laser. And, uh, and of those that got better, 85% uh, of them have improvement that lasts at least six months. And the reason why I say at, le at least six months, because they've only followed patients for six months. It may be longer than that. Um, I, I think it's a good treatment. We've had some really good, uh, good outcomes with patients. I, I don't know the exact number that we have in our practice. It is not 70%. Um, mm -hmm. It's less than 70%. And, but part of the reason uh, th there is, is that, that I, you know, I, I basically view all the patients together. So those are the endometriosis patients, but I have like pelvic nerve injury patients that had like decompression <clears throat> surgery. Those patients are, you know, by default, less likely to get better because they have worse injuries. And I don't mm -hmm. like really separate them in the groups. I'm sure if, I, if I've only taken, you know, pretty much regular pelvic pain, pelvic floor muscle spasm patients, that number is accurate, but our number is lower because we have some complicated patients. For sure, yeah. I mean, you have a very dedicated place where you're getting all the most difficult patients. You're going to have ones that aren't going to be the best responders. Exactly. You know, I and I and I very much support Sola. I think it is a very good treatment. I I like the fact. So so basically, the way I tell patients about Sola is this replaces the Botox injection. The advantage of doing it is that it doesn't require anesthesia. You know, it's it's um, very uh, non-invasive. The risks are absolutely minimal. We've had maybe two patients that kind of got irritated during the treatment and. And they had to stop for a little bit before they restarted it. So those are the risks. The, the, the downsides of it, and that's more specific to my practice, is that a lot of my patients from our, are from out of town. And the whole treatment, the whole cycle, really takes about three weeks. Well, maybe you can shorten it at two weeks if you, if you, if you do it you know, every day because of the nine treatments. Um, so it's not very practical. And that, 
that's the downside of it. Uh, the other downside, and I'm sorry, Chris, I know you have no. questions about other people, so I promise to stop. No, it's good. Keep going. The other, the, the other downside is, you know, I, I like to, and I'm sure every panelist here, the same. We, we like to think of ourselves as the people of science. Um, so we want to know why do things work, and we all know why Botox works. So, you know, we, that's, that's kind of easy. No one really knows why phototherapy works. Uh, they're like, yeah, you know, we have some idea. It works on the mitochondria. I'm like, well, that's just not good enough. And, and that kind of bothers me that we're doing the treatment that, that we don't know how it really works, but it works. So, yeah, I know that's very it's kind of frustrating, I think, for yeah. some of us when we want to know the answers and have clear cut um, treatments and be able to counsel our patients appropriately. Um, well, let's see who else. There's another question for. Um, Dr. Kierpecker, what other, um, you know, I know we were talking about lifestyle modifications um, in diet and exercise and stress reduction. Um, what other specific things um, do patients with endometriosis usually need more help with in, in lifestyle modifications? Um, I would say the, the biggest two, well, kind of all of them, but I would say yeah. the biggest one is probably diet mm -hmm. uh, because there are definitely like triggers that I've heard sort of across the board where most patients have had the same type of trigger, which is usually alcohol is always a big one. Um, and as is caffeine. And those are the two that kind of like, um, most patients have described as being a trigger. And then once they cut those out or decrease those, their pain did get better. Um, mm -hmm. and then other triggers within diet would be basically things like red meat, highly processed or fatty foods. But the things that you would assume would be like unhealthy for you are also typically <laughs> inflammatory in nature. Yeah. Uh, so in a lot of ways, it's, it's um, at least the diet part is sort of like eat healthy, like a healthy whole food uh, plant-based diet is usually going to help with the pain. Um, and then the other aspect of that is sleep. So which, which can be hard because sleep can, or can be interrupted by pain sometimes. And so, you know, if you can't get the pain fully under control, it's hard to get proper sleep. So it's, it, it can be a cyclical problem. But typically, especially on their periods, if they're able to um, sleep like at least seven hours a night, um, that can help reduce pain. And so especially when I have any younger patients that um, tend to either uh, you know, stay up a lot or stay out a lot or are studying for exams because they're younger and they're you know, in college, for those patients, I'm like, you know, especially around your period, like make sure to pay attention to that, make sure to get some get get proper amounts of sleep because that will reduce the pain. And they have found that to be found that to make a difference as well. And then the obvious things like smoking also is pro-inflammatory nicotine in general is pro-inflammatory. Um, and so cutting out things like smoking, um, and any other, even opioids, opioids, I mean, I don't, you know, most of us don't really recommend opioids anyway for chronic pain of any kind. Mm -hmm. Um, but opioids can also typically tend to disrupt sleep and thereby worsen pain also in that regard. Um, and so I would say the two biggest are probably diet and sleep, but you know, all of that plays into it though, stress levels, all of that can also increase basically chronic pain because it's increasing inflammation, it's increasing inflammatory mediators that are circulating in the body. Good, Do you wanna add something, Michael? Chris, can I, yeah, can I, can I make please. a comment? I mean, this oh, is great. I, I, I agree with you 99% of the time. I just want to make one comment. Um, usually, uh, and that's the problem with endometriosis, that usually the, the patients that have pelvic muscle spasm and bladder issues, usually their sleep is really interrupted by the fact that they have to go to the bathroom. So uh, that really shows the importance of treating the bladder because we all know those endometriosis, pelvic floor, bladder patients that get up at night, you know, five times. And what wakes them up is because they, the bladder hurts even when it's distended just a little. Uh, the sleep is so important because, um, and, and, and there's actually a scientific explanation to that. Uh, uh, you, when we sleep, we go into the REM phase of sleep and it's in that REM phase of sleep when our muscles relax. And that's why sleeping um, is so, so super important because of that. One last comment, uh, uh, I agree with coffee and everything else. Some patients who have muscle spasm, they like small amounts of alcohol. And I'm saying small amounts because alcohol is actually a fairly good muscle relaxant. So, 
So, so they actually, again, if they don't overuse it or abuse it, they, they feel better with small amounts of alcohol. Um, to, your, to your point in terms of REM sleep, which that's why I don't recommend sleep aids, like in terms of medications, because it, it seems like a quick fix. Like it seems like taking a sleeping pill is going to help, but it really doesn't yeah. because you have longer sleep, but it's poor quality sleep and you spend less time in REM sleep. And so you don't actually get any of those benefits like relaxing the pelvic floor um, when you use supplements to get sleep rather than kind of doing it more naturally or using um, like a sleep app making sure that your environment is very calm, trying to wind down before sleep for like an hour before sleep, putting your phone away, <laughs> not having blue light <laughs> in front of you. All of those things make a big difference. And then in terms of the bladder, so um, interventionally for a lot of patients I've actually been doing pudendal nerve blocks and pudendal radiofrequency ablation to help with um, vaginal pain, um, va vaginal, rectal, clitoral, any of that pain, but also bladder pain and reducing the amount of time that they, basically reducing the, uh, what would be UTI-like symptoms where you have to go to the bathroom a lot, uh, mm -hmm. you know, frequency, urgency, dysuria, pain with urination, going to the bathroom a lot, feeling like you have to go and then nothing really comes out. All of those symptoms, they can be helped interventionally with a block, which is what I will do to kind of help them improve improve some of that so that they can work on the other things themselves do you ever uh, do you ever sorry chris i good please are we allowed to are we allowed to talk yes, we, yes uh, this is all <laughs> ahead. please sorry mm -hmm. uh do you ever use expiral for the for your blocks so it's longer acting or no i actually use steroid um so yeah so that ends up being the longer acting component so chris sends me Quite a lot of patients for the pedental blocks and radio frequency ablation. Um, and what I do is I do it, I do it transgluteally under x-ray. So I don't go through the vaginal muscles themselves. I go through the buttocks um, mm -hmm. on either side. And depending on where the pain is, usually I go both, unless someone is like it's only on one side, which is rare. Um, and I go along the ischial spine under x-ray and basically give a small dose of numbing medication, not Expiral, but uh, regular Bupivacaine and a small dose of steroid. I usually use dexamethasone. Um, and that tends to last for a long amount of time. So I would say the overall results with that on average have been about six months, which is great in terms of pain relief. Yeah, of course. Very good. Um, okay. Does anyone have anything else to add? Um, do any of the attendees have any questions for us? I mean, I think as, as you know, physicians who treat pain um, conditions, it's really important to look at the patient as a whole. Um, a lot of times patients are suffering of pain for long, long periods of time. They're finally getting um, validized by you know, us because we listen to the patients and we take time to get a full um, history and physical. Um, and so by being able to encompass care from a big panel of, of physicians, having you know, Dr. Kierpecker, having Dr. Kossel, um, having pelvic floor physical therapists, having even urologists and um, gastroenterologists involved in care, as well as you know acupuncture, all these other things, we can really get pain that's chronic get down to a manageable level. A lot of times, you know, we're talking to patients with chronic pain, you know, we don't ever say like we're gonna your pain's gonna be gone. You, you say your pain's gonna be reduced, and I think this is a, gonna be a chronic condition you're gonna have to live with, just like someone who has back pain, who. You know, for most of the days they feel pretty good, but then one day they tweak their back and they have, you know, acute pain. Um, that's going to happen sometimes with chronic pelvic pain patients, um, and that's okay as long as we we address each problem um, systematically, and then have you know other providers that are involved in care that can kind of help reduce and and take over for things that I can't treat. Like so, Dr. Kierpecker can step in, do the blocks for us. Um, Dr. Kossel can help us manage medical management, surgical management. Um, people like Dr. Hibner can step in and do um, amazing things. Writing a, the new, a new uh, textbook um, for the management of chronic pelvic pain that just came out. Um, so it's a practical management. I have ordered a copy off Amazon. I want to sign a copy of Dr. Hibner next time when I see you. All righty, Chris, you're getting a signed copy, you know. It's, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you it's uh, the... the um, the, the book is actually pretty good because it was you know always intended for uh, for physicians, but it's actually the patients that are mostly buying the book. Okay. Oh, good, 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 good. I signed a copy for every patient because we have them in my office, and if they want it, you know, patients can 
buy it from the office. It's exactly the same price as on Amazon, so it's not any different, but at least they get a signed copy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Um, well, I think, I mean, that's pretty much all I, ha I have for today. Um, if, any, if any of the attendees have any questions, we can definitely answer them for you. This will be a recorded um, webinar, so it'll have give access to all patients um, that are part of the endometriosis center so, and program, so they'll have access to this. And, you know, if they need to reach out to any of us, um, our email addresses will be also associated with the um, webinar as well. Anything else for any to add? You know, I, if I may, I'm sorry, I'm kind of overwhelming and talking a lot, but I just want to say that I love how you guys um, function as a team. And I think it really shows that, that um, you know, you at when I you and other places that people are finally getting it, that it's not about treating endometriosis because for years it was all about treating endometriosis, but it's really about treating the pain. And it's actually not even about treating the pain, it's about improving patient's quality of life. Um, yep. and, and that's why you do need that team approach. It's not just, you can't just do the surgery for endometriosis and say, you know, you're done and, and if you're not, and if you're not better then you must be crazy because it, it doesn't work that way. But mm -hmm. I've heard that so much. And I know we all, we've all heard that before. So congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Well, I want to say thank you again to Dr. Hibner, Dr. Kierpecker and Dr. Kossel. Um, again, if any if attendees have any questions before we sign off, um, feel free to, to message us. Um, but if not, I want to say thank you to everyone, um, and we'll meet up again soon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. How are Ukraine? Yes, I know. I love Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.